I read a biography of Martin Luther a few weeks ago, and it was interesting reading about his life. As many of you likely know, Martin Luther was a reformer. He lived in the 1500s. He was German. And one of the big things about him was he was Catholic at the beginning of his life. And what was interesting about his life was that as he studied more about Catholicism and as he looked at the Bible itself more, and then saw some of the things that the Catholic Church was doing at the time, he kind of thought to himself, I don't see any of this in Scripture. One of the big things, one of the big doctrines at the time in the Catholic Church that he really had a problem with was the selling of indulgences. And the idea of indulgences was that you could literally spend a certain amount of money to get a loved one out of purgatory. And it was doubly ironic because the doctrine of purgatory, the idea of purgatory is not found anywhere in scripture, and then also the idea of spending money on your salvation is not found anywhere in scripture. And so Martin Luther had this dilemma, and he was thinking, I don't see any of this in here anywhere. But something that I thought was really interesting and ironic about the life of Martin Luther as I was reading his biography is he believed in infant baptism, and so his whole thing was, I don't see certain things in Scripture, and yet, if, if you've read the Bible, you do not see a single baby baptized in, in the Bible. That is not scriptural. That is nowhere in there. And so today we're going to be talking about Bible authority, and I want us to be thinking through some of these things, maybe some things that if you visited other churches, some things that you might have seen, or if you have friends that go to maybe like a community church or something like that, we need Bible authority for everything we do. If you turn with me to Colossians chapter 3, we see this idea in in practice in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Verse 17, and whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. When we think about Bible authority, the whole point of a Bible authority is that we need Bible authority. We need b- biblical approval for everything that we do. And if you think about some of the things that maybe you've seen at different congregations or heard of in different churches, none of these things are found in Scripture. There are things just like in the days of Martin Luther. There are things in, in different churches today that seem to be commonplace, seem to be everywhere, but the, none of those things, none of the things listed on the board, and I'm sure if we all put our heads together, we could come up with dozens more. None of these things are found in Scripture. None of these do we have authority for. None of these are approved by the New Testament. And so as we get into this idea and as we think more about this, we need to go over some of the basics of Bible authority and what this means and how do we determine what we do and don't have Bible authority. Well, there's three ways that we establish Bible authority. Command, example, and necessary inference. Sometimes necessary inference will also be called implication. You might have heard other names for some of these things, but command, example, and necessary inference. Commands we're familiar with, right? We're, there are certain things we are told to do. And ironically enough, some things that are even commanded in Scripture explicitly, there will still sometimes be debates about. I think about baptism. In Acts 2.38, what should we do to be saved? Repent and be baptized. It's very clear. Um, 1 Peter 3, verse 21, talks about baptism now saves us, and yet some of, so even though some of these things are said so explicitly, are commanded, sometimes these things are still kind of debated about, and and we have these discussions about these things. And so, again, we just need to make sure that we understand what we have authority for, what it means to have authority, and, and, and what that looks like. Examples in Acts 14, 23, for example, we have um, a binding apostolic example of... Um, of multiple elders. We're going to talk more about elders in just a minute, but if you look at the church in the book of Acts and you look at the church throughout the New Testament, there are all these different examples of this is what the first century church was doing. This is what the apostles were telling churches to do in the book of Acts. And so we look at these examples all throughout the New Testament and we see these examples of what these things mean. We also see 
Um, we can make several necessary inferences. There are many things that are doctrinally implied um, that are necessary to be implied. I think about Jesus in Matthew chapter 3. Um, when Jesus is baptized, he, he, and several times throughout Scripture, when, when you read about people being baptized, every time you read about somebody being baptized, they're either going down or they're, coming, they're going down into the water and then they come up out of the water. If they went down into the water, that means they're going to come up. If they're coming up out of the water, that means they went down. So it's very clear through these necessary inferences that we have to make that we, from just from plainly reading Scripture, that the pattern, the biblical pattern, the biblically authorized way of baptizing people is immersion. And something that we need to think about when we think about Bible authority and establishing Bible authority is that Bible authority is a matter of taking God's authority seriously. These are not, these are not just rules that, that people make up for fun. This is something that we need, this is something that we need to take seriously because we take God seriously. If you go to the book of 2 Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, we read exactly how important the Bible is, how important Bible authority is. Second, uh, Second Timothy 3 and verse 16, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. The Bible is authoritative and the Bible is very, very clear. The Bible is easy to read. And so when we read these things, when we see these commands and these examples and we make these necessary inferences, we need to make sure we're following those things because as I mentioned, Bible authority is not just something somebody made up. That's a really common kind of criticism when we talk about command, example, and necessary inference and we talk about these things. A very common maybe excuse or, or argument kind of that people will give is, oh, that's just kind of something that you teach or something that you harp on or something, maybe that's just a soapbox of ours. It, it's not, it's just how people communicate. It's just a matter of taking God's word seriously. It's just a matter of doing what the Bible tells us to do. And it's really just, it's really just common sense. I think about a, an example I heard one time it might kind of seem interesting, but it's really helped me kind of understand some of these things, is if you think about ordering a pizza, if I order a pepperoni pizza, everybody knows exactly what that means. Everybody knows exactly what I'm expecting. And if they give me a Supreme and they say, well, it has pepperonis on it, but we added all this other stuff, I'm not going to be happy about that because I ordered a pepperoni pizza and everybody knows what that means. We don't get to just add all this other stuff because we just have liberty to. We do what the Bible tells us to do, and we don't add or we don't take away from. A lot of times in the law of Moses, God will tell the people, do what I've said and go neither to the right hand nor to the left, right? So when we think about taking God's word seriously, again, it goes back to Bible authority, it goes back to God's authority, it goes back to just common sense, a common sense understanding of what the Bible tells us. If you think about the speed limit, if the speed limit says 45, everybody knows what that means. The speed limit sign doesn't have to be a huge sign that says don't go 44, don't go 46, don't go 50, don't go 90, don't go 30. <laughs> We know what a speed limit of 45 means. And so when we think about Bible authority, that's really what it's coming down to, is we're just going back to basic communication. We're just going back to a basic understanding of what the Bible says. And I want to note one more thing before we continue, is sometimes when you think about this idea of show me in Scripture, if you, if you share this with someone and you say, show me in scripture where you see infant baptism, or see, show me in scripture where you see a praise band or something like that, some people might come back and say, well, kind of over apply it and say, well, show me in scripture where you have pews or a PowerPoint or things like that. Um, they didn't have projectors in the first century church either. But we have to note that there's a clear distinction between adding things to the worship that change the class or change the type of worship that we're doing here or change the scope of the work we're doing here or change the motivation of the work that we're doing here rather than just having aids that are part of this building or part of this worship service. For example, if you think about the singing that we've been doing, right, there are things that help us sing. Songbooks help us sing. Having a song leader helps us sing. But 
we're not going to add instruments because that's a completely different type uh, of music. That's a completely different type of worship, and that's not authorized. That's not allowed according to Scripture. So as we think about some of these things, think about that idea and keep that idea in mind of show me in Scripture where do we find Bible authority for these things? And thinking about these things will help us establish Bible authority. And so one of the most practical ways that we see Bible authority in practice is, is in our worship. Because that's, that's what we're doing here, right? That's the point of what we do here is we're trying to glorify God. So when we go back to the book of Acts and we see in Acts chapter 2, we, we see a perfect example. And throughout the book of Acts, you see many examples of what first century worship looked like, what biblically authorized apostolic, um, what we have apostolic authority for. Um, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, for example, the, the beginning of the church is there. And, and in verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with the people, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. If you really look back at verse 42, you see several of our acts of worship there. We have teaching, singing, giving, weekly communion, praying. We have all these different things that are mentioned. Some of them are mentioned in this passage, but even as we look at a few different passages, for example, in Acts chapter 20, in Acts chapter 20 and verse 24, notice what it says here. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 24, I do not account my life of any value or as precious to myself if only I may finish my course in the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. When, when Paul talks about his mission, his message, what he's going to preach on, he is going to talk about the gospel of the grace of God. There is a limited focus in what he's teaching and what he's going to preach. You might hear a whole multitude of different messages in different places and hear, have different motivations behind different messages in different places. Our motivation, our message always is the gospel of the grace of God. And if you think back to, think back to the beginning, the passage that we started with in, in Colossians chapter 3, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing was mentioned in Colossians chapter 3. Singing is mentioned in Ephesians 5.19. And so you see these different things that are mentioned where the, the, um, the first century church came together. They did these certain things. They came together every week and partook of the Lord's Supper. And so as you study these things and as you see these things, being done, you have this example of this is what the first century church did. This is what's authorized. This is what we have authority for. And it's really important to make sure that we're establishing that authority for everything that we do, because those things that you see on the screen are, are what are authorized and what we see both in Acts chapter 2 and throughout the book of Acts and in other places, which means if there are things that are approved, then there are going to be things that are unapproved. And that could look, up, look a whole multitude of ways, right? We're not going to have a stand-up comedy routine. We're not going to have some sort of political rampage up here. We're not going to have a rock band. We're not going to have some sort of community fundraiser. We're not going to just have a um, communion on, on special occasions for weddings or once a year or twice a year or something like that. We're not going to have all these different extracurricular activities going on because the work we do here, what we're doing here in our in our, especially in our worship, but just in general, we are here to glorify God. We are here to worship God. And so our, our focus in what we're doing here, we're focused on God, we're focused on the spiritual, right? And so as you look through the book of Acts, that was the focus of the apostles there. And that's our focus as well. I think about how sometimes maybe people will say things like, oh, well, I just think it would be really nice or I think it would be really helpful if we could do X, Y, or Z or, or almost like I wish we could add this or this. 
But as we talked about just a minute ago with establishing Bible authority, what I wish or what I think would be neat or what I think would be cool or what I personally am interested in is not the standard of what we're doing here. That's not the point. That's not how we establish authority. And so when we look at these things, we have what's approved, we have the example that we see, and then we have all these different other things that sometimes people will try to add, and that's just simply not the standard. And, but beyond our, our, our worship, we also have the way we are organized, and we have some approved um, positions that, uh, uh, as far as our organization is concerned. We have elders. Um, we have, we have three elders. Sometimes we call them shepherds. We can call them overseers. And sometimes it's interesting because you'll have conversations with people and, and people, because, for example, the word pastor has kind of been used in so many different positions and in so many different ways, broad, in, in the, broadly in, in the religious world at large, sometimes it's hard to get people to go back to the Bible. And what does the Bible talk about about these positions? What is a biblical pastor? What is a biblical elder? What is a biblical overseer? But the fact of the matter is, if we go back to Scripture, we do see elders, and they're called many different names, pastors, shepherds, bishops, overseers, but those are all the same position. They're all the same biblically authorized position. So when we go back to scripture and we read about elders and we read about overseers, we have a standard for what we're talking about there. If you'll turn to Acts chapter 14 and verse 23, as I I, I referenced this passage briefly earlier, but we're going to read it now. In Acts chapter 14 and verse 23, Paul says, um, And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Notice there how um, elders are appointed in every church. Again, it's not just what an elder is or the office of an elder or the qualifications of an elder like we're going to talk about in a minute. There were elders for them in every church church, right? And so there, one thing to note is that there's multiple elders. We need to make that clear. Every time the word elder is used, it's in the plural. There's always a plurality of elders, but also in every church. That's one of the things you saw on the board earlier, something that is fairly common to see in the religious world at large is either one elder over a bunch of different congregations or um, maybe an eldership or some sort of board of directors or something like that over a bunch of churches or almost like a corporation that has planted all these different churches. We don't see any of that in Scripture. And so when we see the biblical pattern for elders and what they are and what that looks like, we have a very clear pattern to follow. If we go back, if we go forward to Acts chapter 20, in Acts chapter 20 and, and verse 17, now from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. Again, elders is plural and church is singular. So there are multiple elders. There's, there are over one church. We see that in Acts chapter 20 and verse 17. But if we go forward now to verse 28, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock. Flock is singular in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Again, it's multiple men that he's talking to here to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. The work of elders is vitally important. They're a biblical role for a reason. It's a very important work. And so we don't need to take this lightly and just kind of twist it to maybe match a corporate setting or match some sort of other thing. It's a very specific work and it's meant to look a specific way. And we have a biblical pattern for what that looks like. We see also the qualifications for elders in multiple places. If you would turn to Titus chapter 1. In in Titus chapter 1, we have a pattern for what this looks like. In in Titus chapter 1, and starting in verse 5, this is why I left you in Crete, so that you might not that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders, again plural, in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. Um, Verse 9, he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke 
those who contradict it. Again, there's multiple passages where we read about the qualifications for elders. These are not suggestions. These are not just, oh, it would be a good idea if you could kind of generally find somebody who matched some of these qualities. It says elders are supposed to be this. It's a job description. If they have this job, they match this description. And and so it's really important to, again, think about the biblical pattern. Think about what's authorized in Scripture. Think about the example that we see in Timothy and Titus and Acts and Paul talking to the Corinthians and throughout the New Testament. This is what eldership looks like. And beyond elders, we have um, deacons as well. If we go back to 1 Timothy chapter 3, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, we have 3, 1 through 7, we have the qualifications for overseers, but right after that, we have the qualifications for deacons. Deacons must likewise be dignified, not double-minded, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. Um, and then down in verse 13, those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in faith that is in Jesus Christ. It's important to know that we have a biblical standard for what these things look like. We have what elders look like. We have what deacons look like. And so if you look at how this local body is organized, we have elders that meet the qualifications of elders. We have deacons that meet the qualifications and do the work of deacons. And that's what we see in scripture. It's as simple as that. And also we have preachers Again, like I talked about with the word pastor, sometimes I tell people I'm a preacher and they'll say, oh, so you're a pastor. And I'm like, no. And and so we kind of get into some of this conversation. But preachers, sometimes they're called evangelists. Sometimes they're called ministers. Um, But there's, there's specific work that that entails. First and second Timothy and Titus are written from Paul as an older preacher to younger preachers. Some of the work is described there. But then in Acts chapter 19... In verse 10, we have an example, um, an authorized example of a localized preacher working with a group for a while. In Acts chapter 19 and verse 10, this continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. So Paul stays in Ephesus. We just read about him talking to the Ephesian elders, but we do have a biblical example of a preacher staying somewhere for a while, working with a group, working in an area, and doing that work. <clears throat> and so it's important, again, just as we're thinking about all these things, we're just looking at what's there, right? Show me in scripture where we get authority to have a localized preacher. What are, do our, what are our elders supposed to look like? What are our deacons supposed to look like? We see those things in scripture, and we see those things clearly stated in scripture. But again, if certain things are approved, then that means certain things are going to be unapproved. So we have that idea of elders over multiple churches, some sort of head pastor or youth pastor or something like that, female leadership, sponsoring churches, a board of directors, different church campuses. You don't see any of that in scripture at all. And so we don't get to just look at, okay, here's the qualifications for elders. Here's what the work of the church looks like. Here's what the organization of the church looks like. And just kind of add to that and reinvent that. And something to think about as far as all of this is concerned is Jehovah God does not need us to reinvent the wheel. He does not need us to be creative for him. He does not need us to change things for him. He has given us a pattern of what this looks like, how it works. And when it's done biblically, it works really well. God's design is really good. And so when we think about these things and and we think about these different, we we think about this leadership, we think about the elders and and those qualifications that are listed. We think about the work of deacons and and that those qualifications that are listed. We have to make sure we're meeting those qualifications and, and listening to the straightforward word of God. And finally, we have the work of the church we have the approved example of, of supporting needy saints. Those needy saints can be both local and abroad. If you go back to the book of Acts, you see several times that needy saints are supported. Um, and again, sometimes they're in a local congregation. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 45, we read that verse earlier. These people are selling their possessions and their belongings, and they're distributing the proceeds to all. That's a really beautiful idea, isn't it? They're just sharing everything, right? Right? I have this, you need this, we're going to share it together. It's just, it's a family, it's a community. That's how it's designed to be. That's what it's supposed to be. And then in Acts chapter 4, 
We see more of this idea um, in verse 32. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. We see that idea of oneness and, and unity. And no one, had, no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. So again, if anybody has any sort of need, they're sharing those things. But notice who they're sharing with. Notice, how, notice where this goes. We're talking about saints here. There's a distinction between Christians and non-Christians. There's a distinction between the work of the local church and the work of an individual. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. But notice how the saints, the family, the brother, we call each other brothers and sisters for a reason, right? The siblings are, are supporting each other, right? And, and, and so we see that idea. And then we see more of that idea kind of extended again to brethren, but beyond just the local body in Acts chapter 11, we see the example of sharing with um, brethren who are in need um, abroad. One of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would, be, there would be a great famine over all the world. And this took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples deter- determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. And so notice how this group has their own autonomy, they have their own eldership, but these brethren are getting money together, they're sending money to this local group who needs, who's gonna need this money because of this famine that's coming. And so again, we see this idea of supporting the local work, supporting the local and needy saints, supporting our members that are in need, but also supporting the needy abroad. We also see the idea of supporting evangelism in 1 Corinthians 9, uh, chapter 9, in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 14, <clears throat> in the same way the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. Again, we're just looking at scripture and seeing what do we see? What do we have biblical authority for? And so part of the work of, of, of a local church that is authorized is supporting the work of evangelism. And I want to make a note here, as I mentioned just a moment ago, about uh, personal responsibility. <clears throat> in Galatians chapter 6, um, if you'll turn with me to Galatians chapter 6, as I mentioned, there's a distinction made between the work of a local body, uh, again, out of our treasury, the work that we're supposed to be involved in and, and allowed to be involved in, um, versus the work of an individual. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9, there's a distinction made between a local work um, using uh, the church um, using their funds versus responsibilities that fall on individuals. Um, Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9, let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are the household of faith. So we're not, when we talk about individual responsibility, when we talk about authority, maybe sometimes we feel like a conversation about authority is just a conversation of all the things we're not allowed to do. Also, when we talk about authority, we're talking about the things that we should be doing and the things that we should be involved in. And, and, and when I talk about what's authorized and what I'm supposed to be doing in my own life, I look to scripture for that as well. And so it's not just a matter of we can't do this, we can't do this, we can't do this. It's a matter of when I see in scripture, this is the organization that we do have, and this is the work that we do have, and, and, and this is what we do have, this is what we are working with, and so I'm going to be involved in those things. In, in First Timothy also, we see another example of this idea of, of individual responsibility, First Timothy 5, and verse 16. Notice what it says here, if any believing woman who has relatives um, who are, has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. Let the church not be burdened so that it may care for those who are truly widows. Again, we see a biblical pattern of the church supplying the needs for needy saints, for widows in a local congregation, but we do not see them just sending money to some sort of widow's home or orphan's home or something like that, supporting some sort of charity. We just don't see that. There are things that we as individuals should be doing. There are things that we should be supporting as individuals and helping with as individuals, but that does not 
breach to the work of a local church. And again, if we have things that are approved, we have things that are unapproved. We are not a business, we are not running a charity, we're not running a college, we're not endorsing any politicians, and we're not gonna financially support unbelievers um, out of the church treasury, that is, right? And so, again, do we need to be... Do we need to be working? Do we need to be serving? Do we need to be helping one another? Absolutely. But the scope of the work that we're doing here and, and the, what we have authority for here it is limited in nature. And so we have things that are approved and we have things that are unapproved. And I want us to think about it this way for a minute as we kind of start to wrap up. What is the number one problem in the world? Sin. And if you think about what is the number one problem in the world? And if you ask people on the street what the number one problem in the world is, you're probably going to get a whole host of answers. But we as believers, we as followers of God, view, and what the Bible says that the number one problem in the world is, is sin. And so what we are going to be busy in and what we are going to be focused on here is sin problems. Our sin problems that we have that we may have here, uh, but sin in our own lives, but that's the focus. Our focus is spiritual. Again, it's, it's not a, a money focus anyway. It's a spiritual focus. Our work is to be a pillar and support of the truth. That's what you see in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. That is what we're doing. That is what we're involved in. That is what is authorized. That is what you see in Scripture. And so when we hear about all these different things and all these different things that churches might be involved in or all these different organizational patterns and all these different types of leadership positions that other places may have, we, our work as a local group, as the church of God, is to be a pillar and support of the truth. That is the pattern that we see. That is the pattern that we follow. What do we see in Scripture? One last passage, Ephesians chapter 4 verses four through six. I had a list on the screen earlier about all these different things that you might see, all these different things that you might see in different churches. But if you look at Ephesians chapter four and verse four, what do we see? There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. There is no pope in the Bible. There, are no, there is no infant baptism in the Bible. There are no youth pastors or head pastors. None of the, all those different lists we've looked at today, none of those things are found in Scripture. But what we do see is one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. We serve an incredible God who has designed his church to work in a certain way that is authorized and limited, and there are things we can and should and must be doing, and there are some things that are just not authorized. You just don't see it. We just don't have authority for it. But when it comes to salvation, the example we do see, what we do have authority for, what we do need is baptism. And so if you're here today and you're outside of Christ and you haven't been baptized into Christ, if you haven't put on Christ, that's something you need to do. That's something you see in scripture often and it's mandatory and it's required. And if we can help you do that, if we can help you come into Christ, we'd love to help you do that as we stand and as we sing this song.